I'll share my screen and we can get going. Um, here we are. Um, so we're going to um, pick up where we left off last time. So the, the title of the lecture is Proof of Hilbert Reciprocity. But I'm, I'm not, I will eventually remind you of the statement of Hilbert Reciprocity, but I want to more um, remind you exactly where we ended last time. So um, I'll pick up a little bit of the discussion from the end of last time. So if F is a field, we associated to this an abelian group called denoted K2 of F. Um, and its definition was as follows. So it's that it's, it's, it was defined essentially by generators and relations. So the generators are, um, well, they're parameterized by uh, units in F cross units in F. So pairs of units in F. Um, so for every pair uh, of non-zero elements of F, A comma B, you're supposed to get an element of this abelian group. And the only relations we impose are um, that A, B, C should be equal to, uh, it's an abelian group written multiplicativity. The, multi the group structure is multiplication, <laughs> is denoted by, as multiplication. Um, uh, so little dot, say. Uh, so you impose multiplicativity in both variables. So A, B, C is equal to A, B, A, C. And then you impose the so-called Steinberg relation that A, B should be trivial uh, if A plus B is equal to one. Um, so this is called the Steinberg relation. Um, so formally, you can define it as the free abelian group on these generators, modulo the subgroup generated by, well, the elements you get by sort of multiplying by the inverse of this guy to move it over here, or in the inverse of this guy to move it over here, and the subgroup generated by these things here. And why did we make this definition of this abelian group? So the, the key property was that uh, giving a homomorphism, so for an arbitrary abelian group A, so homomorphisms, uh, oops, oh, sorry guys, K2, from K to F to A are the same thing as symbols. So in the sense uh, defined by Achillean that we talked about yesterday. So that, these are just um, maps which are multiplicative in each variable and satisfy the Steinberg relation. And this is a, a pure tautology just based on the definition of the abelian group here by generators and relations. Um, so, and then we stated, um, oh, and, and there were particular examples of symbols which are gonna be relevant for the discussion. So for any prime P, we have the tame symbol, uh, which I'll denote um, dot comma dot sub P. Um, so it's defined by saying that a, oh, tame symbol on Q. Uh, so we take our field F to be Q um, and A, B sub P is defined to be equal to well, minus one to the p-adic valuation of A times the p-adic valuation of B times, um, then you take A to the p-adic valuation of B divided by B to the p-adic valuation of A, you note that this has valuation zero and therefore it makes sense to uh, reduce this mod P and you get an element in uh, Z mod PZ cross or FP cross. So this is a, that's our target abelian group for the tame symbol is the multiplicative group Z mod PZ cross. And um, the tame symbol takes this form. Um, and the, this formula is not important, but what is important is the key property that AP sub P is just equal to A mod P uh, when A is relatively prime to P. Um, and that, well, A, B, P is equal to one uh, if both A and B are relatively prime to P. Uh, uh, are, well, what should I say? Both, 
Yeah. If A is an integer, co prime to P. If both A and B are integers, co prime to P. Um, so I want to say, what I really should say is that the, if the piadic valuation of A is zero, and here I want to say that the piadic valuation of A is the same as the piadic valuation of B is zero. Um, okay. Um, but we also had a, so the tame symbol exists also in P equals two, but it takes values in a trivial group, a group with one element. Um, but then there is the, also the two added Hilbert symbol, uh, which uh, is a symbol which I, I won't recall too much about um, for now, but it takes values in the group of signs plus or minus one. And then we ended with stating the following theorem of Tate, which completely calculates K theory of two, the K2 of Q. Um, so K2 of Q um, is isomorphic to the direct sum over P of uh, an abelian group denoted A sub P, uh, where A sub two is the group of signs, so the target of the two adic Hilbert symbol, um, and A sub P for P odd is Z mod P Z cross, so the target of the tame symbol. Um, and the map is induced by, uh, is given on the P factor by uh, the two added Hilbert symbol for P equals two and the tame symbol uh, for P bigger than two. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, to describe a map like this to the, to the direct sum, the direct sum is a subset of the product. Um, so if you want to describe a map from K2 to the direct sum, it's enough to describe the map to the product. And that, then it's enough to describe the map to each of the factors. And we said that maps out of K2Q are the same thing as symbols. And now I'm saying on the P factor, the symbol you choose is the, the two added Hilbert symbol for P equals two and the Tain symbol for uh, P bigger than two. Okay. So now what we're going to do is prove this theorem of Tate. So we have a abelian group given by generators and relations, and now we're going to just identify it com completely. Um, so, but there's one thing we should do right at the beginning, which is say why the map is well defined. I described it as a map to the direct product, but why does it land in the direct sum? So, uh, so first of all, uh, K2, this map uh, lands in. Uh, because um, because of this property that we said earlier that the uh, the tame symbol of uh, x y uh, is trivial uh, if um, yeah if there are no p's in x or y so if the you know so if VP of X and VP of Y are, equal, are both equal to zero, then the tame symbol is trivial. And so any, any rational number has, um, uh, has only finitely many primes occurring in it. So outside some finite set, any symbol uh, will land inside the direct sum. And K2 is by definition generated by these symbols. Um, and therefore everything is a finite word in the symbols, right? And so again, there will always be only finitely many primes occurring. And then outside of that, you're, you're bound to be equal to zero. So yeah, this direct sum is the subset of the product given by those elements, which are eventually zero. Um, so that's why it lands inside the direct sum. So now the statement is well-defined and we can actually think about proving it. Um, I should maybe have said in the general discussion of K2, um, so we have the generators are given by these pairs A comma B, their image in, in this quotient group K2F uh, is denoted by uh, by a curly brace a comma b and curly brace. Um, so it, and it's not again it's not the set containing a and b. It stands for the element the element of k two of f, which is the image of the the generator a comma b. Um, so that's just a bit of notation which we'll be using. Okay. So now, um, how are we going to prove this? We want to show that k two is a direct sum. So it splits up into copies of these very simple groups AP. It often, when you're trying to prove that an abelian group is a direct sum, it often pays to first look at something, try to prove something weaker. 
So instead of saying that it's a direct sum of copies of this group, you should produce a filtration on your group where the associated graded of the filtration is given by the APs. So we're actually going to write down a natural filtration of this group and identify its associated graded with the AP. And then we'll see as part of how we argue for that, that in fact, the filtration is split and it's actually a direct sum. So now let me go into details about this. And you don't have to know what a filtration is a priori. I'll just be saying everything concretely. Um, so a filtration is just a sequence of subgroups, but uh, normal subgroups in general, but we have an abelian group, so. Um, okay, uh, so for n greater than or equal to one, uh, we'll define a subgroup, uh, Ln subset uh, K2 of Q, um, as the group uh, subgroup generated by uh, the symbols uh, x comma y, where x and y are integers, um, uh, which have absolute value uh, less than or equal to n. Okay. So what do we have? Well, we have we have the trivial group uh, sits inside L1, L1 sits inside L2, sits inside L3, etc. Um, and all of them sit inside K2 of Q. So this is our, our so-called filtration of, of K2 of Q. Um, and the, there is a, a couple of remarks I wanna make about this filtration. The first remark is that it's an exhaustive filtration. So if you take the union of all these subgroups, Ln, you get the full group K2 of Q. So every element of K2 of Q lies in some Ln. Um, why is this? Well, it suffices to show that every, L, uh, every symbol XY lies in some Ln um, because uh, K2 of Q is generated by symbols. So everything is a word in the symbol. So if you just take the maximum of N for all of the symbols occurring in the word, then your element of K2 will live in that subgroup. Um, but then again, so these are, these are non-zero rational numbers. Um, but by the bimultiplicativity, we can reduce to the case where they're actually integers. And then yes, it is true that any two integers have absolute value bounded by some n, right? You can just take n to be the maximum of the absolute values of the integers occurring. Um, so that's why the filtration is exhaustive. Um, so the next remark is that we can understand pretty, uh, without too much work, we can understand what L1 is. So we're going to do some, some kind of inductive argument eventually. And so we'll, we should start by understanding what L1 is. So by definition, L1 is generated by, uh, well, I should, I should say non-zero integers, right? Uh, if, like zero, you're not allowed to have a symbol where one of the elements is zero. This, you know, you're supposed to be Q cross. So. Um, non-zero integers of absolute value less than or equal to n. So L1 is generated by non-zero integers, you know, pairs x, y, where they're non-zero integers of absolute value less than or equal to one. So there's only four of those, right? We have minus one, minus one, minus one, 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 minus one, and one, one. However, part of bimultiplicativity is that you're a homomorphism in each variable separately. And this is the identity element in the multiplicative group. So since you have a homomorphism, you know this thing has to be trivial because of this one in this factor. This one has to be trivial because of this one in this factor. And this one's trivial for two separate reasons. Um, so all of these are trivial. And now I will ask you a question. You are dear participants. Is this symbol trivial? And I won't continue until someone says something in response to this. It doesn't have to be an answer, it doesn't have to be correct, but you must, someone must say something. Yes, Eleutherius. To be frank, I, I'm not sure I understood your, your explanation right before about why the, the three symbols below it are, are trivial. So could you please yes. repeat that? Sorry. I'd be very happy to. So the, Thank you. the so we have a universal symbol uh, with values in K2 of Q, right? Um, so, I, so saying that this is trivial in K2 of Q is the same as saying that for any symbol, phi, phi, we have phi of uh, minus one, one is equal to one, right? 
Um, so we, well, certainly this implies that we could just take A to be equal to K2 of Q, but it's equivalent by the universal property. And this is because if you fix, a, if you fix uh, one of the variables and let the other one vary, you get a map from Q cross to A, right? But it's actually a homomorphism by the multiplicativity in the second variable. Now, every homomorphism between groups necessarily sends the identity element to the identity element. So, so this, when you evaluate on x equals one, you have to get one. And that's, um, that's the explanation. So if you want to write it out, you could say that minus one, minus one, uh, minus one, one times minus one, one by bi multiplicativity or by one of our defining relations is uh, brackets minus one, one times one, which is one. And then you can't, we're in a group, so we can cancel this, and we find that minus one, one is the identity. But that's also just repeating the proof that if you have a homomorphism, then it sends the identity to the identity. Um, okay, then thank you for, um, uh, yes, so now someone said something. Would anyone like to say anything else about the question um, about whether minus one, minus one is trivial or not in K2 of Q? Any activity in the chat? I, I can't, I don't quite know how to navigate and read the chat without stopping my share. So, um, oh wait, here we go. You have to click more. Yeah. So there's a, a claim that it's trivial uh, but then it was realized it wasn't correct. So how could we ever hope to prove, let me ask this question, a more general version of the question. How could we ever hope to prove that an element in K2 of a field is non-trivial? It's a group defined by generators and relations. It's, um... You could find the, find the group and the symbol on it on which negative one, negative one stop one indeed by the universal property indeed that is this that is the clever way to prove that an element is not trivial is to find a symbol on which its value is not trivial so are there any symbols on which my, the value of minus one minus one is non-trivial yes uh, if we take the the symbol that we defined on r which was which gave the values one unless both of them were negative, in which case it was minus one, it was an isotropic. We can restrict that to Q. And then if we plug in minus one, minus one to that, we get uh minus one. So it it has so it's non-trivial by that and it has order two. Wonderful. Yes, you answered both the question and my follow-up question. So yes, uh <laughs> so right. indeed this is not trivial, no. Uh and the reason is uh, that if you, yeah, if you, you can calculate the real Hilbert symbol and you get minus one. So if this were trivial in K2, it would necessarily be trivial when you make a homomorphism to any abelian group, or in other words, it would be trivial on any symbol. But we have a symbol, the real Hilbert symbol on which it's minus one. In fact, we also have another one, minus one minus one of Q2 is also equal to minus one. And in fact, we know by the Hilbert reciprocity that we're trying to prove that if you're non-trivial on one of the places, then there also must be some other place in which you're non-trivial. And it can't be an odd prime because these are co-prime to P, so the value of the tame symbol there would be trivial. So this must be true, but you can also see from your formula for the tame symbol at Q2 that it is indeed non-trivial there. And my follow-up question was going to be, what is the order? So now we, we've shown that L1 is generated by a single element. These ones don't do anything. So it's a cyclic group. And now Eleftherius has told us that it's a cyclic group of order two. Why of order two? Yes, go ahead, Eleftherius. Uh, to be fair, I mean, I'm probably going to repeat an argument that I think was mentioned in the in the chat by 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 Garrett. So I have to be frank oh. here. But uh, the idea is that if I do uh, minus one comma minus one times minus one comma minus one, then by uh, the by multiplicativity, this is equal to minus one comma one because I can. Uh, I mean, yes. I can, and then minus one comma one, we have already said it's trivial. So it's, uh, it's not the identity, but it squares to the identity. So it's an involution. Yes, indeed. So in a, another way of saying it is that this element has order two. So under any homomorphism, the value will also have order two. And again, this, uh, you know, 
fi we fix this variable and we get a homomorphism from Q cross to K2 Q cross. And so it's value on minus one must uh, also have order, well, order at, at most two, I should say, but we already said it's non-trivial, so it has order two. Anyway, the conclusion of all this is that L1 is cyclic of order two. Uh, and it's generated by um, minus one, minus one. Very good. Thank you for, thank you guys for participating. Um, so, right. Um, now the next remark is gonna be that, so we have this filtration indexed by natural numbers N, but in fact, something interesting only happens when N is a prime. So if N is not prime, then there's no difference between L minus one and LN. So there are no, the, the jumps in the filtration only occur at prime numbers. So why is this? Well, we have to show that everything in LN minus one lies in LN, but LN minus one is generated by these XYs for the absolute value of X and absolute value of Y uh, less than N. Um, uh, oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. We have to sorry. We have to show the opposite thing. We have to show that I mean, it, we have by, by definition that everything in here is in here. We have to show that if something is an LN, then it's an LN minus one. So if something in LN is generated by a symbol XY, where absolute value of X and absolute value of Y are less than or equal to N. Um, but if N is not a prime, then that means that, well, well, so, you know, that we can write it as a product of of numbers less than n by just looking at its prime factorization. And then using bimultiplicativity, uh, we'll find that this thing indeed lies in the subgroup generated by uh, x, you know, x a, b's with a and b absolute values strictly less than n. So like if you had, for example, n, n, uh, you just write n as a product of primes and then use bimultiplicativity and you'll find that you lie on the previous subgroup. So the only, only way you get something new is at a prime number. Um, Okay, so we know what L1 is, and we know that jumps can only occur at prime numbers. So the, the basic question that remains is what is the quotient of LP mod LP minus one? That tells us how much the filtration is growing as you, as you increase N. So. So that, that'll tell us how big the group K2 of Q is. And now comes the next remark. Um, well, if you look at the tame symbol, um, let me write phi p for the uh, map from k2 of q to z mod p z cross uh, for the, the homomorphism corresponding to the tame symbol. So on, on the generators X comma Y, it goes to the value of the tame symbol on, on X, Y. So P, P, X, uh, P, P of brackets X, Y is equal to uh, X, Y sub P. Um, so that's not a remark, that's a notation. But the remark is that uh, phi P kills uh, L, P minus one. So in other words, if you have anything in L, P minus one, then the value of phi P on that will be the trivial element here. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, everything, uh, every integer uh, uh, x with absolute value of x less than p is co-prime to p. And we said that the tame symbol kills anything with any integer, any pair, if you have a pair of x comma y and they're both integers co-prime to p, then the value of the tame symbol is trivial because their vp is zero. Um, so we have phi p here, we can restrict it to LP uh, and then it kills LP minus one. So that means that we get an induced map from LP mod LP minus one to, so uh, Z mod P Z cross. So. And now the key lemma uh, this is an isomorphism. Uh, for all primes p. I'm sorry for the, I see that there's some sunlight affecting that. I'll see if I can set up some sort of obstruction. Uh, 
need to place something right there. Oh, no, that's also going to obstruct my writing. So that won't do. I have to make it taller. Um, there we go. Um, right. Um, so let's, for the moment, take this key lemma for granted and use it to uh, prove Tate's uh, theorem calculating k theory of two. So assume for now. Um, now what we're going to do is prove by induction uh, that uh, for n bigger than or equal to two, uh, the map from Ln to the direct sum over all primes uh, less than or equal to n of AP um, induced again by the by the uh, U2 Hilbert symbol on the, uh, the, the tooth factor <laughs> uh, and the tame symbol on the P factor. So basically the same map, uh, but just restricted to LN and restricted to the uh, direct sum and projected to the direct sum P less than or equal to N of AP. Um, uh, is an isomorphism. So we're assuming the key lemma. So this will suffice because the, so if this holds, uh, Tate theor Tate's theorem follows uh, by taking the union over n basically. So when you take the union over n on the left, by what we showed originally, you get um, k2 of q. And if you take the union over all n on the right, you get the direct sum of all um, aps. Um, OK. So um, we're supposed to prove it by induction. And therefore, we should start by looking at the case n equals 2. So, so we want to show that L2 maps isomorphically to A2, which is the group of signs, via the two adic Hilbert symbol. But let's look at what the key lemma says when P equals 2. When P equals 2, again, this group is trivial. So what the key lemma is saying is that uh, L2 is actually equal to L1. And we already saw that this is cyclic of order two uh, generated by uh, minus one, minus one. And we also saw that the value of minus one, minus one on the two adic Hilbert symbol is the non trivial element in A2. So we have a homomorphism between cyclic groups of order two, which matches up the generators. Therefore, it must be an isomorphism. So um, that handles the, uh, the base case of our induction. So now, uh, uh, assume, uh, assume the claim for n minus one, and try to derive it for p, derive it for n. So, if n is not prime, uh, both sides are trivial. Well, the bar, sorry, I'm, well, well, we have. Well, sorry, I mean, there's no jumps. So we have ln minus one equals ln by a previous remark, but also clearly. Uh, direct sum over all primes less than or equal to n of AP uh, is equal to the direct sum over all primes less than or equal to n of AP. Because, okay, well, it's the direct sum over the same set. Um, so it, it follows immediately. So if n is not prime, it follows immediately from the inductive hypothesis that, um, that the claim, uh, that it, yeah, that the claim holds. Um, if n is prime, uh, then let's look at, uh, I'm going to use the language of short exact sequences. Um, so, because I, I don't know, because that's how I think. And well, I don't know. So, <laughs> well, so we have a, we have LN, we're interested in going from LN minus one to LN. And the difference between them is controlled by the quotient uh, LN minus uh, mod LN minus one. So in, so in short exact sequence terms, we have a short exact sequence like this, where this map is the inclusion and this is the projection onto the quotient. Um, 
On the other hand, we can write an analogous kind of short exact sequence for this direct sum here. So we have zero going to the direct sum over all primes less than or equal to n minus one of AP going to the direct sum over all primes less than or equal to n of AP. And then what's the quotient here? Well, we've just added one more factor, namely a n. n is a prime here, remember. So I put a n here with the knowledge that n is a prime. Um, so we have this short exact sequence. And that, in fact, we can make compatible maps between these short exact sequences. So the map we know is an isomorphism here uh, extends to the map we want to be an isomorphism here. Um, exactly because of the claim that uh, phi p or phi n, I guess, uh, annihilates ln minus one. That's what makes this diagram commute. That's what gave us the induced map, um, which was an isomorphism by the key lemma. Um, and now we just use the general fact that if you have a map between short exact sequences where the outer terms are isomorphisms, then the middle term is also an isomorphism. Um, so, or in other words, if you have a map between group, yes, Eleutherios. About what, what you just stated, is, isn't this, would this be like one of those, uh, what are they called, like three lemmas or five lemmas or like those things in Maclean's homology, basically, those things at the start? There's, Just yes, like, uh, I, um, there's something called the kernel, co-kernel. I mean, there's a, there's, you could, you should probably just prove this thing directly, honestly, I, I think, um, but there's this uh, more general fact called the co-kernel, kernel, co-kernel long exact sequence or the snake lemma or something. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you have um, any map between short exact sequences with no hi uh, hypotheses about anything being an isomorphism, you get a long exact sequence which goes zero, goes to kernel, goes to kernel, goes to kernel, and then there's a non-trivial map going to the co-kernel of the first guy again, and then co-kernel, co-kernel, and going to zero. That's the and snake lemma, right? That's the snake lemma. And you can read yeah. off the snake lemma of this statement. But I mean, so it's just saying that if you have a map of abelian groups, and then you have a subgroup that maps isomorphically of uh, this guy, which maps isomorphically to a subgroup here, and the induced map on quotients is also an isomorphism, then this map of abelian groups you started with is an isomorphism. And that you, maybe one should just prove directly. I don't know. Um, Thank you. But yeah, <laughs> that said, I, I, don't, I think about it in terms of the snake lemma. Actually, that's even worse. I think about it in terms of derived categories in my head. Um, so uh, that's, how, <laughs> that's how I encode this. Oh, it's, a, oh, it's distinguished triangles. Yeah, OK, fine. Um, yeah, um, but yes, uh, right. So that um, so that's the induct. So the inductive hypothesis is exactly, in other words, uh, or sorry, the inductive step is exactly uh, given by the key lemma here. So we need to. So this is what we really need to prove. So how are we going to? I'll restate the key lemma um, over on another page. So oh uh, shoot, the sun must have moved. Who knew that would happen, right? Uh, okay. So we need that uh, that LP mod LP minus one maps isomorphically via PP uh, to oops uh, to Z mod PZ cross. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, guys. My my pen isn't. There's some connection broken between my brain and my hand. Um, okay, so let's first argue surjectivity. So we need to know that if you have anything here, then it's hit by something in LP, right? But the mod LP minus one doesn't matter for showing surjectivity. Um, so everything in here is represented by, so. Uh, Z mod PZ cross by an integer uh, X, which is strictly between zero and P. Okay, we know we can do that, right? The, the least positive residue mod P is always between zero and P. And if it's a unit, then it's also strictly bigger than zero. Um, then we claim that, that the symbol X comma P, which does lie in LP, uh, well, it, it maps to, uh, class of X and Z mod PZ cross under this purported isomorphism. And well, this is the, you know, the first property of the tame symbol that I recalled. Um, so, so 
So x p p is always equal to x mod p. So that's a so this claim is just a restatement of this property of the tame symbol that I recall. So that shows surjectivity. Um, now you might think that I'm about to prove injectivity, uh, thereby concluding concluding the argument. But it's actually a little tricky to try to directly attack injectivity. So instead, I'll show something a little stronger or seemingly stronger. Um, so next, so next step, uh, we'll show that. That these things that we just used to prove surjectivity, uh, they give all class all class all of the classes uh, in LP mod LP minus one. So every class, everything in LP mod LP minus one, is equal to some x comma p. Or I, well, I should say any, or in other words, anything in LP is congruent to uh, X comma P, mod, some X comma P uh, mod LP minus one. And that will be enough because, well, there's one, here's one possible argument. This means, for, for, example, for example, that this quotient has size less than or equal to P minus one, because that's how many of these guys there are. But because of the surge activity, we also know it has size greater than or equal to P minus one. So therefore, these are abelian groups of the same size, and we have a surjection between them. So it must also be an isomorphism. But or you could also just say that this is explicitly giving an inverse to um, our purported uh, isomorphism here. So, um, so yeah. So it's enough to show that these guys are exactly giving us all the classes in this quotient group. Um, and we'll do this in two steps. So in the first step, so the uh, the XP uh, form a subgroup of the quotient group LP mod LP minus one. So they are closed under multiplication, which is something that has to be true if they're giving all the classes. Um, and then step two will be uh, the XP generate. LP mod LP minus one. And so if you have a, a group which is generated as a group by a subgroup, then it's equal to that subgroup, right? So the subgroup is closed under multiplication, so you don't get anything more when you generate by it. Um, so it, it is indeed enough to handle steps, steps one and two separately. And OK. So for step one, Um, well, we need to look at, uh, so take a zero less than X less than P and zero less than Y less than P. Um, we need that, well, we need to understand uh, X comma P times Y comma P. And we need it to be equal to Z comma P for some Z. Uh, or not equal to, but a congruent mod LP minus one uh, for some zero less than Z less than P, right? So then it would be a subgroup. Um, so how will we do this? Well, well, note that this is equal to X, Y comma P. So let's, now we, if we take X and Y, they're between zero and P, but their product need not necessarily lie between zero and P, right? It could be much bigger. Um, like if they're both equal to p minus one, then of course it's, it's way bigger than. But we can always reduce it again mod p, take the least positive residue. So we'll we'll let z be the least positive residue of x y uh, mod p. So then certainly it lies in the required range, um, uh, but we haven't verified this congruence yet. Um, but let's write out. So what, well, in particular, z is congruent to x y mod p. Um, so this means that we have x, y is equal to z plus p times some uh, q, I don't know, where q is an integer or, or a natural number, I guess. Um, and now I want everyone to pay very careful attention to the next step because it's in some sense the crucial step. Um, and it shows the power of the Steinberg relation. 
So let me go back to the very, we have to use this Steinberg relation at some point, right? I mean, it was in the definition of our group K2 and here's where it comes in. So uh, I remind you that the Steinberg relation is this one that says that the symbol A comma B is trivial if A plus B is equal to one. So anytime you have an equation A plus B equals one, you get a relation in, in K2. But it's better than that because we have a field. So anytime you have a relation A plus B equals C, any additive relation whatsoever where everything's non-zero, you're gonna get a relation in K2 because you can just divide by C and then you'll get A over C plus B over C equals one. And then you get a relation in K2, right? So that's what the Steinberg identity is doing for you. It says any additive relation tells you something about K2. And here's an additive relation, X, Y is equal to Z plus P times Q. So let's apply this general principle to that. So let's rewrite this as one is equal to Z over X, Y plus P, Q over X, Y, P times Q over X times Y. I mean, it's weird that I'm using dot here and not here, but uh, it's just multiplication in both cases. Um, so now from the Steinberg relation, we deduce that z divided by xy comma pq divided by xy uh, is trivial. Okay. Um, now, uh, we will be done if we can show that this is congruent to z divided by xy comma p, uh, uh, sorry, comma, uh, oh yeah, comma p. Uh, mod LP minus one. Why is that? Well, so if this is congruent to that mod LP minus one, then that means this is trivial mod LP minus one. But by bimultiplicativity, that's the same thing as saying that Z comma P is congruent to X comma P y com times Y comma P mod LP minus one, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So if you re restate this using bimultiplicativity, it's saying the same as saying z divided by x y comma p is congruent to one. So this, so we, so we do just need to establish this congruence here. Um, but now look, x and y are smaller than p. So any symbol and 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 z is also smaller than p. So all of these guys have absolute value less than p, and these guys have absolute value less than p. So by bimultiplicativity, if we want this to be equal to this, it's gonna be enough to show that Q also has absolute value less than P. So we just need absolute value of Q less than P. Um, yeah. So, uh, and now this is just very elementary. We can just write the formula for Q and check it. So Q is equal to X, Y minus Z divided by P, right? Um, so, uh, well, Q is a positive number, by the way. I mean, everything's positive here. So I just need to show Q is less than P. Um, but this is less than X, Y divided by P. And X and Y are both less than P. So this is less than P squared divided by P, which equals P. So indeed, uh, this Q, the thing you're dividing by um, when, when you're doing this division algorithm thing is, is less than P. And that finishes the, the proof of the key lemma which finishes the proof of Tate's theorem. So QED Tate's calculation. All right. Um, any questions about that? Can you go through this last, uh, why does Q less than P imply the last uh, equivalence? Yes. So I'm, I, I'm gonna ask you to do something in your head, okay? So. We're going to fix the left hand side, the left hand side, the left hand entry of this Steinberg symbol here. And we're going to use bimultiplicativity to write this Steinberg symbol. So this Steinberg symbol is equal to z divided by xy, comma p times z divided by xy, comma q divided by z divided by xy, comma x. You know, divided by z, oh no, it's divided by xy, comma y. Right? And now all of those things, if Q is less than P, then all of those things that I just said, except for this one, are gonna lie in LP minus one because all of the terms involved in both variables have absolute value less than P. So the only one that doesn't is this. So that's all that remains when you use, multi you use multiplicativity in the second variable is what I'm saying. And I'm looking at the clock and seeing that, well, 
<laughs> there's not going to be much time for the second half of the proof, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to take things at their natural pace here. I'm not going to try to rush anything. Um, indeed, yes. Uh, so, so we've established Tate's theorem. K2 of Q um, is isomorphic to a direct sum of P of AP. So there's another way of rephrasing this, I guess. Uh, so, so what does this mean in terms of symbols? So a symbol is a homomorphism out of K2 of Q. And now K2 of Q is isomorphic to this direct sum. So a symbol is the same as a homomorphism from direct sum over P of AP to A, which is the same as separately specifying a homomorphism from AP to A for every prime P. So, Dustin, yes. I interrupt. Yes, please. Um, did we do step two in this previous proof? No, thank you. I forgot to do step two. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Cool. Yes. Step two, I will add to the exercises. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> now it's your problem. No. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Oh, oh no, now I'm uh, out of focus. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, so rephrasing. So for every symbol, uh, phi q cross cross q cross to an arbitrary abelian group A, there exists unique homomorphisms. Uh, I don't know, phi, p, no, that, I already used that notation. Uh, well, I'll just write them a, p to a, maybe I'll call them f, p, um, for all p, such that, um, you know, phi of x comma y uh, is equal to the sum over all primes p of, um, well, let me write, I'll, I'll write the two addict term first. So uh, x, y comma q2, uh, f2 of x comma plus sum over all p greater than two of fp of uh, x, y comma p. So in other words, every symbol can be expressed in terms of the well, symbols occurring in the statement of Tate's theorem, the two addict Hilbert symbol, and then the tame symbol at odd primes. Um, now, you might have, now there's, there was one symbol that we already knew that was missing from the statement of Tate's theorem, and that's the real Hilbert symbol. So, uh, but, but now we know it must somehow be accounted for because, I mean, every symbol is accounted for when you calculate K2 of Q. So let's apply this uh, to, uh, to, yeah, P of X, Y equals X, Y comma R, the real Hilbert symbol. So that is a, a symbol uh, whose target group is plus or minus one, group of order two. Now what this rephrasing tells us is that there, there are, for every prime P, there must be a homomorphism from A sub P to the cyclic group of order two, such that the real Hilbert symbol is expressed in terms of the uh, tame symbol for all primes P. Um, but now, uh, uh, you know, AP when P is odd is Z mod PZ cross. And every map from Z mod PZ cross to the group of order two factors through the, uh, the, uh, the Legendre symbol, which is also a map to plus or minus one. Because the kernel of the Legendre symbol is exactly the squares, which always die on map, any map to a group of order two. So, uh, instead of specifying the FP, we can just specify uh, a map from plus or minus one to plus or minus one. And instead of saying we factor through the tame symbol, we can actually say we factor through the p adic Hilbert symbol. So in the case where the target group has order two, uh, we can replace yeah, the tame symbol by the Hilbert symbol. So, so if A has order two, yeah. so plus minus one has order two. So we get 
Oh, and I used, I used additive notation. I'm sorry, guys. I said I was going to use multiplicative notation in A all the time. And I got, I got myself confused. Um, so we get that, uh, uh, well, there exists uh, epsilon p in 0, 1 for all p, such that uh, the real Hilbert symbol x, y is always equal to the product overall uh, prime is p of uh, the p-adic Hilbert symbol x, y, q, p raised to the epsilon p. So, so the real Hilbert symbol, yeah, for, uh, for all x, y, and p cross. So the, the epsilon p is just encoding the possible whether this homomorphism from plus or minus one to plus or minus one is trivial or not. Um, and um, so now the gain is going to be, so to finish uh, Hilbert reciprocity says that uh, epsilon p is equal to equals equal to one for all p, or in other words, all the primes are contributing when we try to express the Hilbert symbol and real Hilbert symbol in terms of the p-adic Hilbert symbols. So that was that's an equivalent form of the statement of Hilbert reciprocity, just this uh, this product formula here. Um, so how are we going to show that? Well. Um, well, we're just going to plug in a bunch of rational numbers and see what the relation has to be as best we can. So plug in uh, minus one minus one, then we deduce that minus one is equal to the, well, uh, you know, the two added Hilbert symbol to the epsilon two times, uh, but then all the other odd primes are the the value of the p adic Hilbert symbol on minus one minus one is going to be trivial for all odd primes p because it's a tame symbol. So that one's not contributing there. So we deduce that minus one is equal to minus one to the epsilon two, which means epsilon two must be doing something. Yeah, so it has to be plus one. Uh, so the two adic Hilbert symbol has to be contributing. Otherwise, this formula couldn't be valid when you plug in minus one minus one. Um, so that's good news. Um, now, if uh, if P is a prime which is congruent to one mod four, um, uh, we can plug in minus one comma P, and then over here the real the, you know the real Hilbert symbol is going to be trivial here, so we'll get plus one is equal to, um, and then the two adic Hilbert symbol is equal to minus one to the P minus one over two. Uh, um, uh, wait, just a second. I'm getting myself confused. I better check my notes. Um, oh, no, sorry. P is congruent to three mod four. Yeah, that's why I was getting confused. Um, minus one to the P minus one over two uh, times. And then the only other thing for similar reasons uh, which can contribute is the P at a Kilbert symbol. So all the other values will have to be trivial because, again, it's the tame symbol and you know, it'll be co prime to every other odd prime. Um, but this is equal to minus one. So this must also, uh, oh, sorry, uh, to the epsilon p. So this must also be equal to minus one, which shows that the epsilon p is also there. It's also equal to plus one. Um, so we've shown that epsilon p is equal to, is there, is equal to one for two and for any prime congruent to three mod four. Um, if p, uh, now if p is not congruent to three mod four, it's either congruent to one mod eight or five mod eight. And for five mod eight, you can do a similar deduction by looking at the uh, value uh, two comma p. And you'll be able to deduce that uh, epsilon p is equal to one. So the epsilon p is there. So the only remaining case is p con congruent to one mod eight um, for checking that the p at a Hilbert symbol has to contribute. And there you need to do some extra work, which is actually quite difficult. So there you need to use a lemma, uh, which says that if p is a prime congruent to one mod eight, then there exists a prime Q less than P such that uh, P is a quadratic non-residue modulo Q. So P is not a square mod Q. If you have this, uh, you can look at, at the symbol P comma Q and use induction to show uh, that epsilon P has to also be, uh, has to also exist. 
because the only thing, uh, the only other, you know, the only, uh, this, the, the P adic, the, the Hilbert symbol is trivial unless you're P or Q here. For this, for this p comma q here, unless you're at the prime p or q here, and then at q you're going to be non-trivial. Therefore, you have to be non-trivial at p um, by the product formula, which will mean that um, which means that epsilon p has to be contributing. But proving this lemma is actually quite difficult, and uh, <laughs> I had originally thought we'd actually have time to do it, but it, uh, that's really not the case. So maybe I'll actually put it in the exercises with the you know. Just so you guys see at least a sketch of the argument, and if you want to work work it out, you can. It's a very clever elementary argument, but it does take a lot of work. Um, right. So that was it for um, Hilbert reciprocity, um, and that's it for today's lecture. Although, of course, I'm willing to take questions. Ariane, that's correct. Yes, I was responding to the chat. Um, uh, Eleutherius, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering because I'm hoping to kind of go through this proof uh, again because it, it's it's a bit lengthy. Is there any uh, specific textbook that you're following for this particular proof? Or absolutely, I'm very closely following. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, oh, now I forget what the book's called. Just a second. It's a book by Milner on algebraic K theory. Um, now I have to, let me see what exactly it's called and exactly what chapter. Um, chapter, oh darn. I think it's chapter seven of Milner's book on algebraic K theory. Um, Is it the introduction to algebraic K theory? Yes, yeah, that's what it's called, oh, thanks. I'll, I'll have a look, thank you. Chapter seven, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. It's something about. You'll see. It's the one that's about K two. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Yep. And the book is freely available online, I believe. So, if you Google it, you'll you'll find it. Yes. Another question. Uh, yeah, it just yeah, it just just came to me. I think I wanted to ask it probably from the last time because we've mentioned this construction. Of a of a universe of a universal symbol on a on a field, which I guess if we think of it as a, as an initial object in the category, it would be unique up to some isomorphism of symbols. In case our field is uh, local, because we've also constructed the the Hilbert symbol for local fields, would the Hilbert symbol be the universal symbol in the case of a of a local field? That's an excellent question. The answer is no, but for bad reason. Um, so, oftentimes when you consider local fields, you know, QPR, you really have to consider them as topological fields. So you have to take the topology into account to get clean results. And um, it turns out that if you just take the bare definition of K2 of QP or K2 of R for that matter, you can prove, this is actually a good exercise, thanks for mentioning it, um, you can prove that you get an uncountable abelian group just because, well, yeah, what do you, I mean, there just aren't, there are just aren't enough relations uh, to, to collapse all of the symbols, the pure symbols down um, into anything reasonable. That's actually a very nice exercise. Uh, not too easy, I suppose. Well, anyway, I don't have to put everything in the exercise sheets. But if you ask for the analogous topological abelian group classifying continuous Steinberg symbols, with values in a Hausdorff topological, you have to have Hausdorff with the values in a Hausdorff topological abelian group. Then the answer is yes, the Hilbert symbol is uh, is the uh, initial one, is the universal one. So once you add the continuity into the statement, then it becomes true. But if you're just looking at, at, at QP as an abstract field, and you know Steinberg symbols is ab maps to an abstract abelian group, then it's actually not true. Oh. Because basically, and I mean, it follows from what you said, because the Hilbert symbol maps into uh, Z mod 2Z, whereas if K2 QP and K2R are actually uncountable, then obviously they're not isomorphic to Z mod 2Z, right? So Correct. the symbols can be isomorphic. Correct. Yeah, so there are some exotic symbols, but they break the natural structure of QP and R. They, they're not continuous. That's kind of, oh, yeah. so there are, I yeah. See. 
there are other symbols, but they're, you don't want to look at them, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sure. And that, by the way, the statement about continuous Steinberg symbols is also in Milner's book. Yeah, same chapter. I have a question. Uh, last time you, you told us that uh, you didn't like this proof. Yeah. Why is that? Oh, yes, yes. It's because what this proof really gives you is, is yeah, some relation between the real Hilbert symbols and the Piatic Hilbert symbols, right? And then you have to use clever tricks to see that it's the, the correct relation, yeah, that all of these epsilon p's are equal to one. And in particular, this lemma I didn't prove. I mean, yeah, well, the proof is just a very clever. I mean, it's somewhat natural, I guess. Anyway, I feel like if you're giving a proof of Hilbert reciprocity, your proof should somehow directly explain why that relation holds. It shouldn't say that some random relation has to hold and then by tricks figure out that it must be the correct one. And That's why I don't like, I, I didn't really mean I don't like it. I do like it. It's just, for me, it's not a, it's not a satisfying proof. Of the world. Does there exist such a satisfying proof? Yes, there are at least two. Um, so the whole formalism of global class field theory as structured by Artman and Tate and Iwasawa um, is, a, you know, it makes it into a statement of a similar form as Hilbert reciprocity and gives sort of natural proofs for it. Um, and when you see there's an incident, then some insane specialization of it, the most non-trivial, uh, the simplest non-trivial case is Hilbert reciprocity. Um, so, but that involves this whole cohomological formalism for number fields and so on. Um, there's also another proof that directly explains it, which is really different in nature, which is based on, well, there's this subscript two in K2, right? And what does that stand for? Actually, so the, the correct definition of K theory in general uh, was, def was uh, given by uh, Quillen. And he, he defined that, uh, you know, Kn for any n should always be the nth homotopy group of some space called the K theory space. K of Are you n. writing down right now? I'm writing down um, for my own benefit. Uh, <laughs> you're free to do the same on your end. <laughs> so, I, I mean, yeah, so I'm writing down just what I'm saying. I'm not writing down anything more. Um, so the KN group is the nth homotopy group of some space, K of F. And there's actually a proof of Hilbert reciprocity, which, you know, does the reciprocity at the level of these K theory spaces. And then it's much harder to, to cheat and give tricky proofs because, you know, to prove something about spaces, you really have to pin it down and understand why it's true. Um, but that proof is actually uh, uses a lot of algebraic topology and um, is quite complicated to, to understand. Um, although in my mind, it's quite, it's, it's, it's very natural and it has good explanatory power. Um, but yeah, so those are the only two proofs I know that, um, that I consider the good proofs. Yeah, Eleutherius? So with regards to, to what you just said about the, you know, Quillen's, uh, you know, idea that, that K theory is, can be thought of as, well, KN is some nth homotopy group of a space. Would this apply to like K theory of, okay, can this idea be applied to, because I mean, I, I've heard of K theory of like a ring or an additive category or a topological space. Would this apply to all of those K theories, like um, for all those cases? The first two, but not the last. Not oh, the topological yeah. space one. Yeah, that requires some additional machinations. I mean, um, that's that, that's a little bit of it. Yeah, ironically, yeah? Like, <laughs> you'd think that that would be the easiest to put into this framework, but no. Um, yeah. Um, and, and K0 would be the connected components. It would be the pi yeah. zero of that's that right. space. That's right. OK, I see. Thank you. And by the way, it also this relates to your previous, your comment on the previous lecture, Eleftherios, where you said that the product formula is analogous, the product formula for absolute values is analogous to the, um, the Hilbert reciprocity law. Well, in this K-theoretic approach, it, it is just two different specializations of the same space level result. Like you can take pi two and you get the Hilbert product formula and you can take pi one and you get some form of the, uh, the product formula for, uh, for absolute values. So there you can really see them as part of a family. Um, 
in a quite precise way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I don't know, maybe Akil knows more proofs of Hilbert reciprocity. Uh, I, don't, I mean, oftentimes you prove it by proving quadratic reciprocity, but that's, um, that, that destroys the symmetry of the situation as well. Like it, it doesn't involve all contributions from all primes anymore. So there are actually very few people who have the reciprocity. Yeah. yeah. I was also just going to comment. So um, like, I guess, for example, this proof doesn't directly generalize or end this computation doesn't directly work for other number fields, right? Right. So this is a, yeah, this is a very interesting story. You, yeah, you can, I, you can ask what the analog of Tate's calculation is for an arbitrary number field. And it's very, very interesting. So there's nothing, nothing as exact but there's something quite beautiful going on. Uh, maybe I, I, I can't resist telling you guys the ones that stick around at least. So let me let me share my screen actually, because this is a, it's a bit of a story, but trust me, it's worth it. Um, so so you can so we, in K two of Q, there was this weird thing that we we took the tame symbol at odd primes, and we had this extra thing we we had to take at, at the prime equals two. We had to put the two adic Hilbert symbol in by hand. But let's rephrase Tate's theorem just in terms of tame symbols. So we have K2 of Q mapping to the direct sum over all primes P of Z mod PZ cross. And then the kernel of this is actually, in, in Quillen's language, can actually be expressed as K2 of the integers. So Quillen's definition works just as well for arbitrary commutative rings as it does for fields. And it's some general, general thing that tells you that, yeah, well. And so, so Tate's calculation, uh, uh, is equivalent to saying that k2 of z is a uh, is z mod 2 or plus or minus 1. So it, it can be equivalent equivalently phrased as a, a calculation of k2z but now it's a much simpler uh, abelian group you're talking about just the abelian group of signs. Um, now for a general number field you have something similar you have k2 of f mapping to direct sum over all place over all non-archimedean places so uh, not you not dividing infinity is I guess how people you do it and then you know the residue field the units in the residue field and again it's surjective and the kernel is again k2 of the ring of integers of your number field and then the question is what's this guy and it's not known in general what this guy is is an abelian group but it's known that it's finite and it's almost known that its value its order is up to some trivial factor, trivial and easy to understand factor. Uh, the same thing as the value of the Dedekind zeta function of f at the point minus one, which uh, is only well defined because the zeta function has analytic continuation and happens to be a rational number. Um, and then that some trivial factor you multiply it with cancels the denominator and makes it an integer. And it's exactly the same as the order of this group. So this is at least known up to powers of two. Uh, uh, by work of Wiles, um, and it's expected that the you know powers of two are correct as well. Well, I didn't tell you what the trivial factor is, but it is it is quite easy to understand. So, for example, when you take f equals q, then you have the Riemann zeta function, and uh, zeta q of minus one is minus one over twelve. I don't know how well known that fact is, but uh, and then k two of q is two, and you, you can work out the trivial factor, and it's it's minus one over twenty four. Oh no, sorry, it's minus twenty four. Um, and it's not, I mean, you might think this is a little bit mysterious, but this is a 24 has a very, I mean, the prop, the reason it's 24 here is basically, ah, never mind, it's too long a story. It's very easy to calculate the 24 a priori. Um, yeah, it's because 24 is the smallest number such that everything in every unit mod 20 is the largest number such that every unit mod 24 squares to one. So every element in the unit group has order two. That's a good little, good little exercise in number theory. 24 is the largest integer with the property that every unit has order two. And that, that's essentially why the 24 appears there. And then so you're really relating two mysterious quantities with each other in this, um, in this isomorphic, in this equality for a general number field. But it doesn't tell you, doesn't tell you about the structure of this as an abelian group, right? It only tells you its order. Um, yeah. But anyway, this is a whole part of a whole big relationship between special values of zeta functions or L functions and orders of various L abelian groups that are naturally attached to number fields or more general objects. And it's one of the most mysterious and uh, kind of fascinating aspects in, in modern number theory. 
Um, because there's no reason, I mean, why should they be related, right? I mean, it just this comes right out of the blue, right? Yes, Ophiris? So about what, what you just wrote. So the first exact sequence that you wrote for with K2Z, that would be a split exact sequence, right? By, yes. by Tate's result. Yes, indeed. Because it's yeah. uh, and is it like, a, uh, and for the second thing that you wrote with a dedicated uh, zeta function, is it like in the general case for number fields, does a similar thing happen as in we're looking for some quotient that is just, I guess, two torsion or something? Because in the case of Z mod 24 Z star, you said that every element has order two. And so, uh, it's like no, a two it's torsion it's thing. The, the fact that it's Z here and Z here and, and Z here is actually a, a bit of a red herring. So um, it, you don't, it's the anal analogous thing, it doesn't involve looking at OF mod something or another. I mean, it, um, it has to do with how, how F sits in a relation to cyclotomic fields. And then, um, I mean, the, it's, uh, I mean, it's oh, sorry again. It's a bit of a long story. Yeah. Yes. I don't, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, we'll hear more tomorrow. And don't yes. forget other things today. Mm -hmm.